Good evening, New Life Baptist Church. You should be there in the book of Hosea, Hosea chapter 7. And if you look at verse number 2, Hosea chapter 7, verse number 2, it says, And they consider not in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. And so the Lord here is speaking about remembering the wickedness of Israel. Um, and so the title for the sermon this evening is God's Remembrance of Sin. God's Remembrance of Sin. Now let's start there in verse number 1. It says, When I would have healed Israel, then the iniquity of Ephraim was discovered, and the wickedness of Samaria, for they committed falsehood, and the thief cometh in, and the troop of robbers spoileth without. And so the first verse speaks about you know, God's desire to heal uh, Israel, to heal this northern kingdom. And of course, speaking of Ephraim, don't forget Ephraim was one of the tribes uh, one of the uh, tribes of the northern kingdom, one of the larger tribes, and Samaria was the capital city of Israel. And so God's desire is to heal this northern kingdom of Israel. But as he's going about to heal them, or as he goes to desire to heal them, it becomes discovered in the eyes of the Lord that they have these further wickedness on their land. Uh, some of these things that it's mentioned there, for they commit falsehoods. So they're not truth tellers, they're telling lies. Uh, the thief cometh in, they're, they're, they're doing thievery. The trip of robbers, again, thief there. Um, and so the Lord, you know, as, as it were, and of course the Lord knows all things. You know, this is not teaching that there are things that God does not know. But what he's saying is, as his, uh, as his heart's desire was to come and, and be like a, a doctor or, or a nurse, to come and heal this nation, it, there's just more wickedness that's coming out of the nation, right? And, and so he refuses to heal them properly. He refuses to, to uh, be a blessing to them, right? Verse number two, it says, And they consider not in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. And so the people of Israel are committing all manners of sin against the Lord. And they've not considered, they've forgotten the fact or they've just become ignorant of the fact that God knows the sins that they have in their hearts. You know, that they've completely lost the sensitivity of knowing that God sees when I sin. And, and brethren, the truth is when you sin, you know, I, I don't care who you've hidden it from. I don't care if you've hidden it from your, from your wife or your husband or, you know, your, your parents, children, or, or, you know, your family members, people that you care about. Some, you know, you've done a sin and, and you've hidden it from man. But you need to remember, every time you sin, that God has seen that sin. Okay? You know, the worst state you could ever be in is, oh man, I got away with that sin. You know, so and so does not know about it. God knows about it. God sees it. And the Bible is saying here that God will remember all their wickedness. You know, God has remembered all our sins. Or you say, well, hold on, are we forgiven? Yes, we are. We'll get to that point, okay? But if you commit sin, don't ever get to the point that I think, well, God doesn't care about it. God cares about it. God will chastise us as His children if we are not upfront about it, if we don't humble ourselves and confess it before God. God can come in and bring swift chastisement upon us. And uh, if I can just, uh, you know, I'm going to read to you because it says here, uh, and they consider not in their hearts, right? And just so um, you know, this is a very uh, famous passage in the Bible, Jeremiah 17, verse 9. I'll just read it to you. It says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Then it says in verse number 10, I, the Lord, search the heart, I try the reins even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. And so, brethren, understand, if you have wickedness that you've done, that you've hidden in your heart, God sees it, God will test you, and he's going to give every man according to his ways. If, if your way is chastisement because of this wickedness, God will make sure that you serve the, the right type of punishment, the right kind of chastisement, uh, from his wrath, from his fury, for sin against the Lord. All right? So keep that in mind. Look at verse number 3, Hosea chapter 7, and verse number 3. It says, They make the king glad with their wickedness, and the princes with their lies. And so here we're talking about kings and princes, so obviously the, those that are in authority, you know, the, the governing authorities over the land. And it says the king is made glad with their wickedness. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll soon prove to you that this is referring to alcohol. 
that uh, the, the reason uh, uh, the king and the princes are easily uh, misled is because they're drunk. Okay, And so you have the people of the land or maybe even surrounding uh, cities that are full of worldliness and wickedness and uh, you know, idolatry. They're having an influence on those in authority. Okay? And, and these people that are in authority, they don't, they don't re realize the wickedness that is being done against them. They don't, uh, they don't discern the lies that are being spoken about them. And the, the truth is, when you're drunk, when you're under the influence of alcohol, okay, and you don't have to be off your face drunk. You can just be tipsy. You can just have, have a, a small influence of, of you know, alcohol in your life. It's going to cause you to not be able to discern between what is right and wrong. It's going to dull your senses. You know? You're not going to know if you're in danger. You're not going to know whether someone has lied to you or is committing weakness to you. What I'm trying to say is alcohol will cause you to be easily fooled. Okay? And you'll soon see that this is definitely about alcohol. But let's go to verse number 4. It says... They are all adulterers, as an oven heated by the baker, who ceaseth from rising after he have kneaded the dough until it be leavened. And so God starts using uh, illustrations of a baker that's baking bread, okay, in his bakery. And what it's saying here is that the kinds of sins that are going on in the land, of course, is adultery. Don't forget adultery is you not being faithful to your wife or to your husband, not being faithful to your, to your marriage vows. Okay, uh, taking you know a, a man you know taking another woman rather than uh, you know or ch you know cheating on his wife. This is adultery. This is the kind of sin that has taken the land. And when it says there that I'll just read it again, verse number four. They are all adulterers as an oven heated by the baker. So we know a baker will heat his oven up, right? When he needs to cook, when he needs to bake. Okay, so there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you know, obviously the illustration is is a true illustration. The illustration is not sinful. Okay, because the, the baker heats up the oven and then says, "Who ceaseth from rising after he have kneaded the dough?" So the baker will need to knead the dough, right? Get it ready for for baking until it be leavened. So once he puts the dough into the oven. The baker will leave it alone in the oven until the entire thing is leavened, right? He's not going to come and pull out the dough out of the oven while it's midway uh, being leavened or being cooked, being baked. No, he's going to put it in the oven and the, and, and, and the job's going to be finished before he takes it out of the oven. He's going to make sure that it's fully leavened before it's, he takes it out and, and he can eat that bread. And so it's using this parallel of uh, baking bread uh, with adultery or all the kinds of sins that are taking place in this land. And so if you want to think about it like this, you know, kneading the dough, getting it prepared for the oven is similar to the thoughts of committing adultery. It's the temptation, right? It's you, you know, uh, you know if you're a married man, you know, looking at an, another woman and you start to lust after her, you know, you start to be tempted and, and you think, well, you know what, I, there's a possibility that I, you know, I, I look at this woman and, and you, know, uh, you know, I wish I could have her for myself. That's kind of the idea of, of kneading the dough, okay? But then once the dough is kneaded with the leaven and with the, the flour, it is placed in the oven. So that's the next step, right? And listen, you know, temptation in of itself is not sin. You know, we're all tempted to sin, but when the, when, the, when, when the temptation comes, you need to make sure that you don't give in to that temptation, which, is, which becomes sin. And of course, that leads to uh, destruction. But, you know, the, the thought here is, you know, it's not just the thinking of the sin, but once that dough is put into the oven, now you're taking action on that sin. Right? You're committing some type of sin in your body. Maybe you've taken that woman uh, for yourself. And the idea is, once it's in the oven... You're not going to go and take it out of the oven until it's fully realized, until it's fully accomplished. And the Bible is saying here that adultery is the kind of sin, once you start down that path, you're going to go all the way. You know, it's a very difficult sin to get out of. You know, the one example that I, you know, we're familiar with, that one of the most famous examples was with Joseph. You know, and he had uh, Potiphar's wife who was, you know, trying to seduce him. You know, he had to physically remove himself. He had to physically run away from that situation, you know, and not give in to that temptation, okay? But once you start down this, this, this pathway of adultery, you're going to go all the way and commit a grievous sin, all right? And so... There's no going back. Once you have committed sin, 
you know, that sin is specifically you've committed adultery, okay, and you've cheated on your wife, you know, you've lied, uh, to, uh, to, you know, you've uh, betrayed the vows that you've made on your wedding day. If you can keep your finger there, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 5. Because the Bible often warns us, and it's, you know, with, with this idea of, of uh, leaven being kind of sin, the Bible speaks about this quite a few times in the Bible for us. So one of the first times that it's, well, you know, one of the times it's referring to the local church here is 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 5. And the reason this topic was brought up is because one man in that church was uh, committing fornication with his father's wife, all right? And the people in the church were allowing that to just be a known secret, or it's an open secret, I suppose, and people were not taking appropriate action to kick that person out of the church. And in 1 Corinthians 5, 5, Paul explains, you've got to kick this guy out of the church. It says there, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And so this man is saved. His spirit will be saved on the day, the day of the Lord Jesus, the rapture. He's going to be there for the resurrection. He's going to be there for the new body. You know, he's going to receive the resurrected body. Uh, but, you know, we need to kick certain people out of the church, uh, you know, and, and Satan will have an opportunity to uh, damage that person, you know. So the, the best thing for a person that's been kicked out of church is to get back into church as soon as possible before Satan has, you know, gotten his claws into that person. But then it says in verse number six, your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. You see, if you allow people in the church to commit grievous sins, it's going to cause the entire church to commit grievous sins. All right? And this is important, you know, uh, to, if someone has committed a grievous sin to the point that it's mentioned here, they need to be called out. The whole church needs to be made aware of the sin that that person has committed and that person needs to be kicked out of the church. All right. Number one, so people know how serious it is. Number two, if a little bit of that leaven has started to creep into other people's lives, they know they need to get rid of that quickly. Otherwise, they will be met with the same fate. All right. It's to keep the church pure. You know, leaven will leaven, you know, yeast. You know, once you put yeast into dough, it's going to cause the entire bread to be affected by that yeast. And we do not want our church, New Life Baptist Church, to be uh, full of sin, right? I just allow somebody to openly sin, uh, extremeless, extreme wicked, wicked sins that's causing others to be influenced by that. You know, we cannot allow that in our presence. Look at verse number seven. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. It says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye, are, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven. Uh, this, is, you know, this is the correct understanding. We shouldn't be prideful and, say, and, and, you know, and, and understand that we're all growing. We're at different stages in our Christian life. And sometimes even your pastor has to make, you know, some mild corrections as I, I, as I preach. And I hope you understand, you know, I'm not perfect. I don't have all knowledge of the Bible. You know, it, it, you know we're all growing. We're all growing, right? And the reason I bring that up is because, you know, just recently when I preached the Christmas message on Isaiah 9 6, I had to correct my understanding of what the everlasting Father was in reference to Jesus Christ. You know, and so obviously if I'm constantly making serious mistakes, you know, if I'm, if I'm like constantly preaching heresy or something crazy like that, you know, that, that would show you that I'm a novice, that I should never have been put into a position of, of, of the bishop of a church. But, you know, obviously when it comes to a pastor, yeah, you know, or even any preacher, there can be times where they will say something that is not exactly 100% uh, correct or, you know, they may have a different interpretation of something which, is, which, isn't, which isn't quite right. But that's, you know, very different from just preaching outright heresy. But see, not only should we focus on truth, but we need to be sincere, okay? So, you know, we need to make sure that we, we, we have a care, we, we care for one another, we treat, we treat each other with sincerity, 
Okay, that means we truly have a love for one another. We truly have a love for truth, but we need to make sure we have the sincerity and the truth. And this will help our church make sure that we stay as an unleavened uh, lump, right? That we're not affected by the sin that may uh, creep into our churches. Can you also now turn to Luke chapter 12, verse number 1? Luke chapter 12 and verse number 1. Luke chapter 12. And verse number one, the Bible reads, In the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trolled one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples first of all. So now Jesus Christ is about to teach his disciples. He says, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. And so the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the time of Jesus there, they also had leaven. Okay, They also had a sin that would be easily spread amongst other people. right? And that sin specifically here is hypocrisy. They would say one thing and do another. And brethren, we need to be careful of that leaven as well. That especially when we're gathered together as, 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 as God's people or just as we deal with ourselves and, and we put forth a Christian testimony with, with our work colleagues, our acquaintances, our family and friends, that we don't, you know, act like hypocrites. You know, we have the truth, as I said, right? And, and sometimes, you know, we can be very zealous from the truth, but then people will not receive the truth if they see that we're acting out of hypocrisy, that we say one thing but do another. We need to make sure that we're honest and open, we communicate well with one another, because if we try to hide things, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. And so what God is saying here is, you know, eventually your hypocrisy will be found out, okay? As I said, you may may deceive yourself into thinking that nobody has seen my sin, nobody knows my sin, but I told you God knows it. God sees it. And you know what? If you continue down this way, don't be surprised if one day just God puts your sin on show. Okay? So you never hide it. Okay? God sees what you have done. And God may very well allow you one day, like for other people, to be made known of your sin. And that would bring great shame amongst your brethren or amongst those that are around you. You know, there's a passage in the Bible in Numbers 32 verse 23 it says ye have sinned against the lord and be sure your sin will find you out be sure your sin will find you out okay oh man what do i do well you go to god you don't hide your sin you confess it to god and you say sorry to god you make things right and if you've committed some of these grievous sins like adultery Okay, like fornication, uh, like drunkenness, as we'll soon see. You know, these are things you need to make sure that you never do it again. All right. Ask God to help you with some spiritual victory in your life that you never uh, be tempted or, you know, or you will be tempted, you know, but you never give in to that temptation. Okay, you need God's strength. You need the spirit of God and you need to be walking in the new man. You need to be walking in the spirit of God to help you overcome these kind of wicked behavior. All right, so you can't hide your sins from the Lord. He will chastise you if you try. And like I said, don't be surprised if one day your fellow man is, uh, you know, is aware of your sin. And that, like I said, will bring you great shame. Can you please go back to Hosea? Hosea chapter 7 and verse number 5. Hosea chapter 7 and verse number 5. Now, you may remember in verse number 3, it mentioned the kings and the princes. Well, the kings and princes are brought up once again here in verse number 5. And I told you that they were, they were being fooled by alcohol. So this is where it comes from. Verse number five. In the day of our king, the princes have made him sick with bottles of wine. He stretched out his hand with scorners. And so this wine is able to make the king sick. Now it says in the day of our king. When it says the day of our king, it's speaking about a, a special day of the king. You know, so, so, you know, there, there might be a day where the king is being celebrated, for example. You know, we might think of a birthday or maybe even for the king, it would be like the day of his coronation, the day that he took on the office and started to lead, you know, as a king. Well, anyway, there's a specific day that people are commemorating the king and they bring out the wine, 
Okay, the princes, other people there that want to take advantage of the king, they bring out their wine, they bring out the alcohol, and it causes the king to become sick. And then it says, he stretched out his hand with scorners. And so once again, he's intermingling with bad people, with bad character. Again, this is the effect of alcohol. He can't discern between people that mean him well and people that are trying to harm him. Okay, so um, he's, you know, they're parting up, they're drinking, they're drinking alcohol. Look at verse number six. It goes back to the illustration of the baker and his oven. It says, For they made ready their heart like an oven, whilst they lie in wait, their baker sleepeth all the night. In the morning it burneth as a flaming fire. Okay. So notice that it says there that, uh, 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 sorry. Yeah, so verse number six, for they have made ready their heart like an oven. Okay, the idea there is speaking about the, the effects of, the al of alcohol. You know, if you start drinking alcohol and you start getting under the, the effects of, you know, alcoholism, you know, you start to mess up, you know, and kill your brain cells with that kind of stuff, it's going to cause you to make your heart ready, okay, like an oven. You know, you're preparing yourself to commit sins. You're, commi you're preparing yourselves to, to commit wickedness and adultery and all manners of sin, you know? That's what alcohol does. It just prepares your heart to get into worse sins, okay? And it says, While they lie in wait, their baker sleepeth all the night. In the morning it burneth as a flame in fire. So let's take the idea of the baker once again. Again, the illustration of the baker is not sinful. It's just been used as an illustration. So, you know, in this day and age, obviously they didn't have electricity. So the baker would need to heat up his oven, right and as it common is commonly is people often bake their bread in the morning all right so it's fresh and so in order for the baker's oven to be ready for the morning he would need to make sure that it's heated up all night okay all night it, it, it's it's uh, you know the the, the, the fires the, the wood whatever whatever system is in place it's burning it's making the oven nice and hot so by the morning it's ready to be used to bake bread Okay, so in the morning, it's the hottest that it's going to be. It's ready to bake. And so it's using that illustration because it says that in the morning, it burneth as a flaming fire. So it's extremely hot. It's a flaming fire, right, in the morning. Well, that's comparing, uh, that's, that's been compared to uh, sin or adultery, as it were, here. And so when it says that baker sleepeth all the night, that's the idea of the adultery that's taking place in the kingdom, right? And so you may you know, spend all night with another person that is not your spouse, okay? And you know, you're, you're engrossed in that sin, you're blind in that sin, you know, maybe you've been under the effects of alcohol, you don't know exactly what you've done, you know it's, maybe you know it's wrong, but you just think, well, at this point I'm going to do it no matter what. Well, when you wake up in the morning, it's going to burn you. It's going to be like, like a flaming fire. You're going to wake up in the morning. You're going to come to your senses and go, man, what have I just done? Okay, that's what the Bible's teaching us. What have I just done? And you're going to be burnt. You're going to suffer grief and sorrow for the great sin that you've committed uh, over the night. And so, uh, yeah, so the, idea, so the thought there, brethren, is that sin burns. Okay, sin will burn. And, you know, if you've ever suffered quite a, you know, serious burn, it's going to leave a scar. You know, you, you, you're always going to have that on your body. And so, you know, even though God is able to forgive us our sins, of course he has. And of course, our sins were nailed on the cross of Jesus Christ. But many times when you've committed grievous sins, it leaves ongoing consequences, right? It could just be the grief. It could be effects, maybe a broken marriage. Maybe, uh, you know, you're, you're, you know, especially something like adultery, could be that your spouse just doesn't trust you from this day forward. You know, that they've lost that trust that they once had for you. And so you need to understand that while sin might seem pleasurable, you know, uh, for a moment, it'll burn you. It'll burn you. And it can have lasting consequences, right? That you just have to deal with with the rest of your life. And it's just going to be an extra challenge, an extra difficulty that you have to uh, deal with. Okay? Look at verse number seven. It says... They are, all, they are all hot as an oven. So again, the oven, the bake, baker, it just continues, right? And have devoured their judges. All their kings are fallen. There is none among them that calleth unto me. So when it says that their judges and their, have been devoured and their kings have fallen, you know, <clears throat> it's saying that 
you know, those in authority, okay, the, those that pass judgment, okay, those that make our laws, right, our governing authorities, that they have been devoured, they've fallen uh, by the hands of these wicked people that are causing them to get drunk, that are causing them to commit all manners of sin. And because of that, God says there is none that calleth, sorry, there is none among them that calleth unto me. So what is it saying here? It's saying that when you get yourself into grievous sin, it's going to harden you against the Lord. You're not going to call upon the Lord for help, you know, in that time of, of committing a grievous act. And brethren, you know, when I think about this, and by the way, you know, it says that have devoured their judges. So judges aren't punishing or, you know, punishing sin or crime the way they are meant to. Now, one, one, of, the, one of the sins that we saw here was adultery. Okay, what is the sin of adultery? If you commit, you know, adultery with another man's wife, the Bible says that's the death penalty, all right? And so they're being affected by this. They're not passing judgment. This kind of sin is running rampant. Hey, adultery is running rampant in Australia. What else has the death penalty? Homosexuality, okay? What else? Murder, what else? Kidnapping, rape, all of these things you know, God has made it fit that they would, uh, that the punishment for these crimes would be the death penalty. Is that what's happening? Is that happening here in Australia? Hey, it wasn't happening in Israel. Okay, the judges have been devoured. They're not doing their jobs properly. The kings have fallen. No, one, no one's passing correct judgments, you know, in the land of Israel. Well, no one's passing correct judgment in the land of Australia either. You know, we're headed in the same direction as these nations, you know, both Israel and then Judah later on, all right? And so, you know, the, the, the punishment is not fitting the crime. And when the punishment does not fit the crime, then the whole lump is going to be leavened. All of Australia will start pursuing sins and specific sins that are crimes and not even think about them, not even consider that God is remembering what we're doing, that God will one day chastise us, judge us and correct us for what we've done. And it says, again, there is none among them that calleth unto me. You know, to call unto the Lord is to pray to the Lord. Are our politicians praying to the Lord these days? Of course not. You know, they, they, they've gotten rid of prayer. You know, this is why you go door to door soul winning. You get to the point with someone at the door, you know, would you like to call upon the name of the Lord right now and, and ask him for the free gift of salvation? Ah, uh, don't want to do that. You know, I mean, uh, Australians, generally speaking, do not pray. You know, they, um, it's almost like they're embarrassed to pray. And you really have to encourage someone, hey, come on. Yeah, you've told me that you've believed the gospel. How about you tell God, the one that is actually offering you the gift of salvation, that this is what you believe. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Listen, if Australia, was ever, if Australia ever had a praying culture, it's been lost. You say, why is it lost? Because our judges have been devoured and our kings have fallen. That's why. Okay, we live in a corrupt nation. We live in a wicked nation. And the authorities that we have in power, they're not doing us any favors. You know, they're just heading back to the same sins, heading on a downward spiral. You know, things are just waxing worse and worse. Verse number eight, please. Hosea 7, verse number eight. Ephraim have mixed himself among the people. Ephraim is a cake not turned. All right, so when it says Ephraim is a cake not turned, again, we're still with a baker, with a baker right? <laughs> now the baker's baking a cake. And, you know, if you're going to, I guess, bake a cake, you've got to turn it, right? Uh, to make sure that the heat is evenly distributed and you have a properly baked cake. Well, if you don't turn it, what's going to happen? If Ephraim is a cake not turned, you're going to have one side that is overcooked and burnt, and one side that is undercooked. You're not going to be able to eat that. You can't eat an undercooked cake or a burnt cake, right? There's no balance in the cake, right? There's no balance whatsoever. And so, you know, basically God is saying that Israel is half-baked, okay? And we don't want to be half-baked Christians. We want to make sure that we're balanced Christians, all right? And, you know, if you've got this half-baked cake or if you're a half-baked Christian, you're, you're, you're good for nothing. You're worthless. You cannot be eaten you know, as you would want to eat a cake. Okay? God cannot you know, uh, profit from you because you are, you're just 
a waste. Okay, so we need to make sure in our Christian life that we um, are balanced. Okay, that we're well baked on on both sides. And what we saw before was the sincerity and the truth. Now, if you can keep your finger there in uh, Hosea, and please go to John chapter one and verse number fourteen. Please go to John chapter one and verse number fourteen. And I love preaching on this topic of being balanced because there are many unbalanced Christians. You know, I hope that I'm pretty balanced, right? Uh, but there's a lot that are unbalanced. And it's not that you're unbalanced out of, um, you know, uh, sort of selfish reasons or anything like that. It's just that sometimes, especially newer Christians, you overvalue or you overcook one side of your Christian life and you leave one side undercooked, okay? And let me just show you what that is. John chapter 1, verse number 14. John chapter 1, verse number 14, speaking about Jesus, it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, as, uh, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, and look at this, full of grace and truth. Now, we saw sincerity and truth. What we see now is Jesus Christ came full of grace and full of truth. Okay? He is truth. Grace. What, what is grace? Undeserved. Uh, undeserved merit. Undeserved favor. Right? If you haven't got the grace, how are you going to cause other people to come your way on the truth if you've got something that is right and somebody else has got what is wrong? Okay, you know, we should desire to teach others, to teach our families, to teach our children, to teach our friends, but you're not going to be effective if you're just banging them with the truth all the time, you know, and, and, and not having any grace. You need the grace so people know this person cares about me, this person's trying to help me, and then when they understand that, you can hit them with the truth and get them, you know, convince the gainsayers of what is right. Okay, so we need to make sure that we're not just Christians that are full of doctrine, but we don't have grace for other people. We don't have grace for our fellow brethren when they do wrong or they say the wrong thing and we just jump down their throats and attack them and criticize them and, and think bad of them. You know, we need to understand that everybody's trying to grow. Everyone's trying to serve God. Everyone wants to be a little bit more like Jesus. Okay, but we're just all at different places in our spiritual growth. And that's where the grace comes in. I mean, Jesus was gracious toward us. Hey, we need to be gracious toward others as well. Can you please go to 1 Corinthians 13? 1 Corinthians 13. So don't be a half-baked Christian, right? Be balanced. Have the grace, have the truth. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 2. 1 Corinthians 13, verse number 2. Paul says, And though I have the gift of prophecy, hey, can Paul preach? Absolutely. And understand all mysteries? Wow. You know, did God reveal a lot of great mysteries to Paul? Absolutely. And all knowledge? Was Paul knowledgeable in the scriptures? Absolutely. And though I have all faith? Hey, was Paul faithful? Absolutely. So that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing or I am worthless. Okay, so you can be a Christian with all the knowledge and understand all the mysteries of the Bible. But if you don't have charity, which is love, okay, then you are nothing. Okay, you're like a, a cake that is not turned. You're burnt on one side and you're undercooked on the other side. Good for nothing. All right, we need to strive to be a balanced Christian. Paul, hey, yes, he rebuked in his letters to the churches. Okay, uh, he had knowledge. He had wisdom that was given to him by God. But he also had charity. He loved his brethren. Okay? When he rebuked, it was for the purpose of correcting them, to edify them, to encourage them, to motivate them. Okay? Not to destroy. And so, you know, I just wanted to give you a couple of examples there. And this is, again, this is one of my favorite topics to preach on. Being balanced. You don't want to be love, love, love. Who cares about the truth? Hey, that's unbalanced as well. But you don't want to be truth, true truth. Who cares about grace and love and sincerity? No, you'd be unbalanced. And both extremes causes you to be good for nothing. Okay? A cake that cannot be eaten. And if you go back to Hosea chapter 7, verse number 8. Hosea chapter 7, verse number 8. 
It started by saying, Ephraim, he have mixed himself among the people. And so the call for us, brethren, is that we do not get ourselves mixed up with the wrong kind of people, that we don't become mixed up in this world. All right? We have to function in this world. Hey, appreciate uh, the good things that are in this world, but let's not get caught up with the things of this world that prevent us from stepping out and serving God. You know, in Titus 2.11, it says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation have appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Okay? So are we called to live in this present world? Absolutely. How are we supposed to live in this present world? Soberly, righteously, and godly. Okay? But not given into ungodliness, not given into worldly lusts. You can see here that the authorities, or I guess the nation as a whole, had mixed themselves with the wrong kind of people, and maybe even mixed themselves with the other nations around it that were worshipping false gods and, and doing all manners of wickedness. Verse number nine. Strangers have devoured his strength, and he knoweth it not. Yea, gray hairs are here and there upon him, and he knoweth not. So this is speaking about uh, the, 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 that, that the nation was in decline, right? It was once a strong nation, Israel was, okay? But strangers have devoured his strength. It, it had become weak, okay? But it says, and he knoweth it not. So the people uh, have forgotten or don't remember their former strength, you know, which is the Lord, you know, the, the former help and the blessings of, the, of God. Like, again, they've forgotten their sinful state. But God has remembered it, right? He, and then it says, Yea, gray hairs are here and there upon him, yet he knoweth not. All right? So the gray hairs obviously represents, that, uh, represents age, right? And as this nation has gotten older, you know, it, there's been some deterioration, right? Uh, it, it's not, uh, you know, bright and vibrant as it once was. You know, the nation had started to get uh, gray hairs. But the nation doesn't even know that it has gray hairs. All right. Now, with me, with black hair, when I get a white hair or gray hair, it's very noticeable. Okay? Uh, for a lot of you guys up there on the Sunshine Coast, you've got like lighter hair or blonde hair. You know, you're kind of blessed because when you get white hair, no one really notices. But, but with me or my wife, you know, it's quite obvious when we start to show the white hairs. And so this is something that is supposed to be noticeable, but the nation had gotten to a point where they don't even notice how they've deteriorated, how they've gotten older, how they've, how they've lost their prosperity and, and, and national strength and national identity. They've gone the way of the heathen. Okay? They had forgotten, but God had not forgotten their sins. Another sin that's brought up here in verse number 10, and the pride of Israel testifieth to his face. So this is very similar to Hosea 5.5. 5. You may remember a very similar statement being made that basically the pride is on the face of Israel. Like it's hard in its face against God and it's obvious that this nation was full of pride. And then it says, And they do not return to the Lord their God, nor seek Him for all this. And so we need to be careful of the sin of pride because pride will cause you to not return to the Lord, right? If you're in a sinful condition and you're full of pride and you're like, well, I'm just going to do what I want, you're not going to turn back to the Lord, all right? Nor seek Him for all this, you know? Pride will uh, stop you from asking or seeking God for help and guidance uh, in your uh, present uh, difficulties. Verse number 11. Ephraim also is like a silly dove without heart. They call to Egypt, they go to Assyria. Now, silly, of course, re references to the idea of being foolish, you know, foolish dove. So it's kind of like a, a, a stupid or brain dead dove, a brain dead ant like bird, right? Uh, without heart. So the heart is far from God. But you know what they do? They, instead of going to God for help, it says they call to Egypt, they go to Assyria. Now, I'm also preaching through Jeremiah, as you guys know, uh, down here at Blessed Hope Baptist Church. And when I went, went through like, Jeremiah chapter 2, it helped me understand this idea of Egypt and Assyria. It's a bit more clearer there. But basically, you know, the, the, the northern kingdom was aware, you know, either by the preaching of Hosea or just by what's happening in, in, in you know, world events around them, that the Assyrians were on their way to uh, take them into exile and to, to destroy their nation. And so instead of turning to God for help, Israel, they went to Egypt. They went to one of their former enemies, you know, trying to, help, trying to get Egypt to help them against the Assyrians, 
Well, Egypt declined, right? And then uh, what they, they, well, what can we do? They go to Assyria instead. They, they send their ambassadors. They try to make peace with, with Assyria. And it's not going to work, okay? The Assyrians are on their way. They're, they're on their, uh, they've already got their marching orders. They've got their, their, their you know, their uh, objective to destroy Israel. And so, you know, this is the situation sometimes when you're far from the Lord and you're committing sin and you need help. You're going to go to bad counsel. You're going to go to bad help. You're going to go and seek the, the, the wisdom and the guidance of man when really you should be going straight to the Lord God. You, know, you should be opening up His Word, praying to the Lord and asking, God, help me. God, forgive me for my sins. Okay? Instead of going to worldly counsel, counselors. Okay? That's like going to Egypt or going to Assyria. Verse number 12. When they shall go... So that's when they, when they shall go to Egypt and Assyria for help. He said, uh, God says, I will spread my net upon them. That's like a trap. I will bring them down as the fowls of the heaven. I will chastise them as their con congregation have heard. So God is promising some severe chastisement to come upon uh, the Israelites. And of course, that was by the Assyrian captivity that was on its way. And so what, the one great thing that I can see here, it says, I will chastise them as their congregation have heard. Okay? So what I'm really thankful about, at least in this time, that the preachers were preaching about chastisements. They were preaching that if you uh, uh, sin against the Lord, the Lord will chastise you for the wrong that you've done. Okay? They were aware of that preaching. Part of that preaching, of course, came through Hosea and came from other great men of God. And so at least, you know, at least they're hearing that God will judge you, God will chastise you when you sin against Him. Okay, and so we need to make sure that this congregation, or, or actually you guys up in New Life Baptist Church, right, um, are also being taught the chastisement of God. You know, don't fool yourself into thinking that you can just sin and, and continue and, and, and have no regrets and, and just seek after worldliness and turn your hearts against God and think you're going to get away with chastisement. Hey, that will happen to the non-believer. But if you're God's people, if you're saved, you're a child of God, He's going to chastise you for the wrong that you've done. All right? So once again, get it right with God. Get it right with God, right? Go and confess your sins. Keep a clean account with God as much as you possibly can. Verse number 13. Woe unto them, for they have fled from me. Destruction unto them, because they have transgressed against me. Though I have redeemed them, yet they have spoken lies against me. When God says that he's redeemed them, I don't think that's referring to um, salvation. Because actually many of them were not even saved. Okay? And look, we, obviously we can tie this into salvation. If we want to take a spiritual lesson for us, we've been redeemed, okay? Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, okay? If we've been redeemed, then yeah. If, you know, if, if God has blessed us and God has done us well, we should not go and speak lies against God or about God, okay? And this is why when you preach behind the pulpit, men, you need to make sure that you're careful not to preach lies about God. You know, you, you may have accidentally believed something to not be true. You need to make sure that you're preaching the truth. But the direct uh, context of this for, for them, I believe, is referring to that they've been redeemed by, by Egypt, of course, in the time of Exodus through Moses. And, you know, redeemed from all the other enemies that they have surrounding their land, where God has given them many victories in their battles. And so God has seen them through, because, of course, the context is that the Assyrians are coming, right? And God has redeemed them from in the past, okay? But instead of being thankful to God, instead of seeking God and asking Him to help Him against the Assyrians, instead they have spoken lies against God. Okay? That's a pretty bad place to be. Verse number 14. And they have not cried unto me with their heart when they howled upon their beds. So look, sin will cause you to howl upon your bed. Sin will bring you great sorrow. All right? But listen, they don't cry with this great sorrow that they, that they have. They're not crying to the Lord. Okay? They're just crying because of the, the consequences of their sins. It says, They assemble themselves for corn and wine, and they rebel against me. So they commit a grievous sin. They get burnt by the sin. Okay? They're in grief. They're in sorrow. They're howling for the sins that they've done. 
But what do they do? They go back to the calling wine. They go back to partying. They go back to their old ways, right? And they rebel against God. Verse number 15. Though I have bound and strengthened their arms, yet they do imagine mischief against me. I believe verse 15 is referring back to verse number 1 where it said, uh, when I would have healed Israel. So, you know, God was making this attempt to heal Israel. And, you know, verse number 15 says that, though I have bound and strengthened their arms. All right. So, you know, God has, you know, is trying to strengthen that nation. God is trying to help that nation. The reason Hosea is preaching and other preachers are preaching is to help this nation. And God has uh, bounded and strengthened their arms. I think the idea there is, you know, maybe they had like a broken arm. You know, don't, don't forget that this nation was losing its strength. And so when you, you know, when you've got a broken bone, you need to uh, bound, bind it. You know, you need to make sure that, you know, you don't move it much and you allow the bone to heal back together. And so God has made sure that the, the healing has taken place. He's given them strength. But what do they do? When, the, when, when God steps in and blesses them and God steps in and is trying to help them, what do they do with the blessings that God has given them? It says, yet do they imagine mischief against me. Okay, so instead of being thankful for God's aid and blessings, they take it for granted and use what God has given them for mischief. Brethren, be careful about what you spend your money on. You know, God has blessed you with work. God has blessed you with your bank account and your resources. We're blessed in Australia, brethren. We're blessed in Australia. God has given us so much. All right? God has given us so much. And so the warning here, brethren, is to not take what God has given us and use it for mischief. Okay? Not to use it for rebellion against God. Be careful what you invest your time and your money and your resources on when God has given them to you to strengthen you, to help you, to bless you. And then you might, you know, you take it and you use it to sin against God. You know, you don't want to be like the Israelites here of, of old. Verse number 16. They return but not to the Most High. They are like a deceitful bow. Their princes shall fall by the sword for the rage of their tongue. This shall be their derision in the land of Egypt. So God is, you know, uh, finishing this chapter here, you know, using the analogy of, of warfare. So you have the, the mention of the sword, which is a close combat weapon, and you've got the bow, the bow and arrow, which is a long distance weapon. And so God is basically saying that, you know, Israel is like this deceitful bow, okay? So normally, if you're this, you know, if, if, if there's, you've got an enemy at a distance, you know, far distance, if you had a bow and arrow, you should be able to take him out before they can even come close to harming you with a sword. All right? But a deceitful bow is one that doesn't shoot straight. Okay? So you aim at your enemies and it's just, it's, it's going off target. You know, it's deceitful. It's not working. The, the bow is broken somehow. And because the bow is broken, your enemy can advance and with his sword, plunge it into you. Okay? And so, this is the same idea here. That, you know, the devil wants to destroy us. The devil throws all kinds of thoughts and temptations. And it's not, not just the devil, it's our flesh. It's this world, you know. And we need to be like these archers with a bow that works and taking out our enemy before it comes and defiles us. Before it defiles our bodies, before it defiles our minds. We need to be taking that bow and shooting it, okay. But it only works... If you're close to the Lord, it only works if you're walking in God's ways. You know, when you're far from God and you're prideful and you commit all kinds of sins and you're, you're in darkness, you're not in fellowship with God. Well, the time when it comes to try, you're trying to defend yourself, your arrow is going to be off target. Okay. And destruction will come, you know, by, by the, you know, as it were, that sword there. Okay. Now, conclusion. You know, I mentioned that the title for the sermon this evening was God's Remembrance of Sin. And you know what? God remembered their sin and brought great judgment upon that nation. Okay? But we're children of God, and I don't want God to remember my sins. Okay? I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I, you know, I'm thankful that when we get to heaven, you know, those sins are long gone. Okay? And we have that new resurrected body which will never be tempted to sin, which, will, which, which cannot sin. Okay, it'll be in the same alignment. It'll be lined up with the new man, with the spirit that we have in us. Okay, so I don't want God to remember my sin. Now, if you can take your Bibles and turn to Colossians chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2, verse number 13. Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 13. Because I don't want to leave you with the thought that 
you know, um, when you got saved, when you caught upon the Lord and you believed on His death, burial, and resurrection, when you believed the gospel, that somehow God is still remembering your sins. Okay? That's not the situation. In Colossians 2.13, it says, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, have He quickened together with Him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Okay? So, brethren, those sins were nailed to the cross. Okay? And the cross is important, but even more important in the, in the gospel message is that Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. So he was not bound on that cross forever. Okay? The, the sins were nailed on the cross, and we have victory through Jesus Christ, through the power of his resurrection. And so, praise God that our sins back then, 2,000 years ago, that's where they were. And who cares about that now? Because we have a resurrected Christ. Can you please go to Psalm 103, verse 12? Psalm 103 and verse number 12. So once again, you know, the cross represents our position before God. Okay? Our sins have been forgiven. But don't forget, we have our walk with God. And our walk, you know, hopefully we're walking with the Lord. Hopefully we're not walking away from the Lord. And when we commit sin... We're in darkness. We're not in fellowship with God when we're doing a sin like that. And so we need forgiveness on a daily basis as well. Not for salvation, but forgiveness to maintain a fellowship with God. You go to Psalm 103, verse number 12. And I'm going to read to you from Jeremiah 31, 34, which says, And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. God's remembrance of sin. Look, I don't want God to remember my sin. Well, what a great promise, right? As long as we're saved, as we're children of God, He will remember our sin no more. You're in Psalm 103 verse 12. We'll end on this one. It says, As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Listen, east will never meet west. That's how far God has removed our transgressions, our iniquities, our wickedness, our sin from his sight. Praise God for a great God that we serve. Okay? So I don't want you to live a life where God is constantly remembering your sin. That's a bad place to be. Hey, how about being in a place where God will remember our sin no more? Number one, you need to be saved. Number two, you need to be walking in the ways of the Lord. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to thank you so much for this portion of Scripture. Lord, uh, help us to learn from the mistakes of the Israelites of old here. And Lord, help us to be aware of your chastisement and judgment and that you, Lord, see when we commit our sins. And so there's no hiding, Lord. Uh, you, will make, you, you will put on display. You will uh, ensure that our sin will find us out, Lord. But you've given us an, uh, the, um, the method by which we can come before you and be, be humble and confess our sins before you, Lord, to maintain a close walk and fellowship with you. Help us to never become as far from you, Lord, as much as we see um, Israel here of old. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, brethren.